Good evening, or morning or afternoon, depending on where you may be. My name's Malcolm Byrne. You're listening to The Long Way Round. And uh, on to my, tonight's program, I'm really, really quite happy and pleased to catch up with uh, Tara Reed. Tara Reed was a guest, I guess last year, I spoke to Tara just after her book came out, and um, I caught up with Tara. She's now living in Moscow, Russia. And uh, just for your a little background, Tara Reed is a, an RT, Russian television contributor, author, and former U.S. Senate aide, and a TNT a geopolitical analyst. She's also a host of the Politics of Survival. Tara, who's a former Joe Biden staffer, was one of seven women who came forward regarding Biden's inappropriate behavior. In 2022, she shared her entire history in her first book, a memoir entitled Left Out, When the Truth Doesn't Fit In. Tara is passionate about animal rescue and has worked her entire life to protect those with no voice. In 2023, after being targeted by the U.S. Department of Justice and the Biden administration, Tara applied for asylum in Russia. She now lives in Moscow. And um, on her first show, um, we discussed her book, uh, which shared the aftermath of the re-victimization of speaking out about her sexual assault with then-Senator Joe Biden in 1993, where the shaming attacks and threats instigated by the media sent her into a personal tailspin through a book she forged, forged a path of hope so other survivors may have dignity to come forward. Hell, me too. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm very pleased this, this conversation was recorded uh, earlier this week from, from Moscow, where Tara is now happily, I must add, living. And, uh, well, you'll find out in this interview. So check it out. Hello. Hey there. Hi, Tara. Hello. How are you Hi, doing? Hi, Malcolm. How are you? Good, I'm good, fair. good. Well, so, thank you so much for um, for, for uh, being back on the show. I, I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. It's been well over a year, I suppose. And yeah. um, I, I understand that there's been some significant changes in your life. So I wanted to talk about that first and <laughs> foremost. <laughs> so, um, so uh, I, I watched a, you one of your shows recently. I forget who you were talking to, but you'd said something along the lines of um, you feel very comfortable because um, you, you're not being harassed and you're not getting all the death threats and the, the kind of crap that you're experiencing back in the good old United States. So talk about yeah. your, your journey and how that all came about and, and what things are like for you now, please. Um, yeah, um, Malcolm, thanks so much again for having me back on. Well, uh, yeah, the it's very beautiful here in Moscow, Russia. Um, today is actually kind of a gray day, but it's still a gorgeous city, and and uh, most of the time it's been it's been a beautiful summer, very sunny and warm, and lots of things to do. Um, so I came here for vacation and to meet with the publishers of my book mm -hmm. because we were going to distribute it in Russia, and I was overseeing the translation and. Uh, I was here for about a week. I had packed for about a week. And uh, then it became clear that through communications I was getting from uh, people that were close to me and others that uh, if I were to go home, um, I was going to be possibly arrested and uh, and taken into custody. Um, and uh, there was rumors of violation of sanctions, all kinds of things, because I accepted a plane ticket from Channel One. Um, and then there's a sealed indictment, which I still, with my attorneys, don't know. There was uh, red notices by Interpol, which were um, soon should be getting back. Um, so I consulted with attorneys, with other people that were experts that know more than I do about these things. And um, and then I, my final decision was made, uh, gathering you know what information I could and the data points that I could um, when I spoke with uh, Matt Gates. And Matt Gates. Uh, basically advised me that it was not safe for me to come back, um, in his opinion. And, uh, you know, he just gave me information. He didn't give me advice, but he said, you know, he knew how these people operated and he feared for my physical safety and uh, he couldn't protect me. And uh, so that was the final 
conversation that I had when a U.S. congressman basically, you know, <laughs> expresses that for a U.S. citizen. I think that's pretty significant. I was supposed to go and testify before Congress against Biden. And uh, you, I think everyone now, if particularly at this point in history, has seen the viciousness that that political machine is going after any enemy, perceived enemy, um, and, and what the fallout is. So I chose to stay and ask for asylum. And I had a, a friend of mine, uh, Maria Butina, who, Masha, who is my sponsor, and she helped me uh, kind of get settled here. Uh, again, she didn't give advice either. She's in the state Duma, so it's not her place. Um, so I saw the advice that I got was mostly from attorneys and from U.S., former U.S. intelligence uh, that were familiar with my case. So that led me to staying. And then um, I know that there was a couple, I gave a press conference, um, which people can still find if they go to my YouTube channel or Rumble and they can find it uh, that goes into depth. But I also, uh, you know, um, uh, there was press conferences given by John Kirby, the head of the NSA, National Security Agency, who uh, basically announced that it was quite safe for me to come back. And it was interesting because in that brief press conference he gave about me, he, uh, you know, just basically said he didn't know why I would be asking for citizenship in Russia. And the the reporter hadn't even asked the question and he volunteered, you know, um, that that I was safe in the United States and the government wouldn't harm me. Um, but the reporter well, didn't ask that. I mean, John, yeah. John, John you're, you're talking to Admiral John Kirby, I, I see him. <laughs> yes. I mean, that guy, that guy you know, lie, he just lies for a living. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's, you know, the amount of lying that comes out of that man's mouth is stunning. It's astounding. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So it's almost like so that's, the, that's long and short of it. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's this great scene in the, uh, I don't know if you recall the film Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman <laughs> back in the 70s. Yes. Was, and there's this great scene at, towards the end of the film where you know he's he's sort of unwittingly become uh general custer's scout <laughs> and 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 because general custer doesn't trust trust him uh he says everything that this guy says i'll you know if he says go this if he says right we'll go left and he says up we'll go down and that'll be our bellwether and so when when custer asked him like should we go down into that valley and 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 uh Dustin Hoffman kind of looks around and sort of says, and right there I knew I had him. So I told him, don't go down there. <laughs> so <laughs> it's almost like Admiral Kirby's that guy. It's like if he says yeah. it's safe to come back, it means don't come back, you know. So <laughs> that's exactly what my attorney said, Malcolm. He watched it and he said it, he found it chilling. And he found um he also found it chilling that he made a joke. He said the NSA doesn't make jokes. Um, right. He made it like joke right at the beginning of the of the thing, saying he couldn't deign to imagine what was going on in the head of someone getting Russian citizenship. Well, I'll tell you what's going on in the head of someone yes. getting Russian citizenship Absolutely. is that I was a U.S. citizen that worked for the government as well and um, had the government coming after me because I was telling the truth and I was looking for safe haven and uh, Russia is providing that. So. Um, and not just safe haven, but also, you know, just giving me dignity and employment and kindness. And I owe them a lot. And I um, really appreciate the warmth um, and uh, from the Russian people. And n they haven't politicized my case. You know, you, know, you they really haven't. Um, I mean, I, I've spoken out publicly about my case, but they are very uh, re respectful and ask me my permission. And, and then that's it. You know, so. Um, well, you're you're the uh, you're 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 I th I th I've lost count now. I think you're about the fourth or fifth person I've had on the show that has actually been to Russia within the past year. <clears throat> uh, mm -hmm. I, had, I had Alex Christoforo from the Duran was on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he was back and forth between Moscow and Saint Petersburg. And you know, I, I I'd love you. W one of the aims of of the show recently is to dispel some of these myths about russia um you know this this non-stop propaganda that we've been fed for so many years so 
I'd love for you to talk about, you know, a little bit about your life there and sort of, you know, some of the impressions that you might have had dispelled, you know, myths and, and also some of the things that you've seen that were eye openers in terms of just the society there and how people live, you know. I think one of the biggest things that I think they don't want Americans to know in particular and Westerners in general is that there is a very thriving middle class. Um, they have a very efficient transportation system that is very affordable and um, probably less than, it's less than 50 cents to go anywhere. So people that are the working class, people that are working can afford to go anywhere in Moscow. I mean, you can go all over Moscow on the subway system and um, it's very efficient, but there's also scooters and there's bikes and there's taxis and there's trains and, um, you know, you can pick your mode of transport. Of course, there's cars and people do use a lot of cars. Um, but there's also, you know, uh, medical is more affordable. For instance, one of the medications that I had um, that I needed, um, you know, for my uh, heart, heart thing that I was going through, which is now resolving, um, was $800 a month in the U.S. and out of pocket. And here it's... Um, uh, it's thirty dollars for sixty days. <laughs> so, and it's Good the Lord. same executive position. Yeah, so wow. huge difference. Um, you know, uh, for instance, like an MRI is two hundred dollars here out of pocket, mm -hmm. whereas at home it's it's probably thousands of dollars. So, ambulances are um, taken care of. They're paid. You don't have to be bankrupted by that. Um, you have people here, Moscovites, um, but also in other areas of Russia. But here in particular, I know the, the statistic, and that is that 80 to 90 percent of the people own their own apartments and even a dasha outright. So the bank doesn't own it. They own it. Hmm. Um, and so that's a very high number of ownership. So the wages may be a little bit lower than the U.S. when people talk about that, but the cost of living is, is much lower and they're able, they don't pay half their salary in rent. They don't do that. Even in a city like Moscow, which is considered probably one of the most expensive cities in Russia, um, it's affordable. And you see people very well dressed, very well, you know, at a restaurant, restaurants are always full, grocery stores are always full, sanctions are nowhere to be seen. The only thing you see is the absence of some Western businesses and, you know, frankly, you know, who cares? It's like what they say in you know, Russia. Back, 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 back. You don't have McDonald's. Oh, what a tragedy. Well, they do have it, but they renamed it. And right. um, they made the food a little bit better. And then um, as far as, uh, same thing with Starbucks. They have Stars Coffee. So I thought that was kind of a good, kind of good little troll that they did. Um, <sighs> and there's a lot of emphasis on family and on children. So you have a lot of parks, a lot of greenery. A lot of children's activities and festivals and music, um, fountains on hot days, uh, beautiful fountains, beautiful statues, be you know, tons of museums. I've been to like only like three. I mean, there's so many to see. Um, and uh, St. Petersburg is equally stunning. And so is Sochi in its own way. It's Sochi's more of a resort and it's by the ocean. It's gorgeous. Um, and the Southern Caucasus are beautiful. I've been there. It's kind of like wine country, I'm very rural. Um, and I'm about to go to Vladivostok, which is in the Far East. So yes. you know, that'll be a whole different experience. But, you know, Russia is, um, so I gave you kind of like the, the basic living thing. It really surprised me because we're not getting any of that information. And the, and the food is very organic. It's, you know, Monsanto's banned, uh, the genetic testing, gen genetic stuff that they do altering to the food is banned here. Um, so no hormones in the dairies products. So everything's organic. And, um, you know, they did that because they saw how sick the West was getting, the people were getting, and uh, mm -hmm. decided to ban pesticides and um, hormones and things like that in the food. Wow. Well, I, I'm going to sort of play a bit of devil's advocate, push back a little bit in the sense that, and I'm sure you've already encountered this, but I'll, I'll say it straight out, you know, what would what do you say to people who simply say, well, oh, she's become, quote, a Putin apologist. Uh, she's she's, a, you know, being funded by the state as a propaganda tool. Um, what's your response to that kind of accusation? Well, they've been saying that since 2019 when I wasn't here. 
I mean, right. it's kind of silly. It's just sort of the Russophobia that's been ongoing. But like, what does Putin apologize? What does Putin have to apologize for? He's basically taking care of his country and taking care of his sovereign nation. And, well, I, um, I, I, I yes. just mean that, you know, I, I encounter people yeah. almost on a daily basis because my my position is not unlike yours in the sense that right. I, I, yeah. I've had enough exposure to, to people who've been there that to know that, you know, a lot of what we're hearing is nonsense. But, you know, I, I constantly get people saying, well, you know, you wouldn't want to be in Russia because you can't say anything about the government or Vladimir Putin, you know, without being you know, locked up and sent to Siberia and, and uh, you know, everything's state controlled and there's no freedom <laughs> of speech there. Yeah. You know, you hear all of this kind of stuff from some really intelligent, decent people. Yeah, you know? it's nonsense. There's people who don't, who don't, you know, they have p people with different political beliefs, just like in the U.S. They have a lot more political parties here. Um, that's, well, that's for what, sure. That's what um, I heard. Yeah. 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 A lot more. Um, so that's interesting. And um, I don't really, you know, even understand all of the political parties here because I don't know the internal workings of that. But I do know that there's not that. And, and Siberia is actually a vacation spot. I actually want to go there. Like, because yeah. It's really beautiful. Um, so it's like one of the places people go to get in nature to fish and hunt and go to somewhere beautiful because but Lake Bakai is one of the most beautiful lakes in the world, actually, in Siberia. Um, but uh as far as, you know, like the propaganda we're fed, I, I think they basically, the West just doesn't want us to know what it's like to have yes. infrastructure for the working class that works. Shh, because don't tell I think anybody. That, <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. So it's I a think, secret. You know, I think the defensiveness is, I'm not saying the U.S. citizens are bad. I'm saying our leadership is lying to us and it's bad. I'm saying that, that the oligarchs in America are lying to the American citizens because they want to keep people happy with nothing. And, um, you know, I'm in a position where I could, even as a non-citizen, look at purchasing a home if I wanted and um, at a pretty low cost. And so... And imagine for, for the young people here that are actual, you know, Russian citizens that have been, you know, right out of college, they can buy an apartment and own it and start their families and they get um, help. Like, for instance, when a worker is pregnant, um, they get maternity leave or paternity leave. They get leave and they get um, bonuses and help. Uh, they aren't abandoned. Um, and we don't have that in the United States. I mean, uh you know, you'll notice that pensions and some other things went up during COVID here. Like one of the first things they did was up the amount of money they were giving to people here, citizens. They didn't do that in the U.S. I think it was like $700 or whatever. And I think Biden still owes everybody some more money. But um, <laughs> well, so he gave it to Ukraine. Is, I think $700 is the, the lucky number for for the Biden yeah. administration, because that's how much everybody in Hawaii got on Maui. I know. And it's like know, 700 bucks here. Thanks. See you later. Tara, I'd like to discuss um, on a broader political scale some of the um, some of the impressions that you've gotten. Uh, for example, what's the the mood? And well, how would how would you respond for, you know, one of the primary responses, uh, criticisms, of course, of, of Russia right now is that you know, it invaded a sovereign country and that it's an act of aggression and, um, you know, it's a war crime and there's a warrant out, I believe, <clears throat> the ICC uh, uh, for Vladimir Putin directly. So he apparently can't travel outside of Russia right now. He didn't, he wanted to go to BRICS, but he couldn't do it. Um, how do you view that narrative from, from where you're currently sitting ge geographically? Well, geopolitically and geographically, um, the the aggression of the West, um, and I had already talked about this when I was living in the United States, is pretty significant um, that goes back, as far as Ukraine goes, it goes back 2008, 2014, you had the Maidan, you had the coup that was Western-backed, and then you have um, neo-Nazi sympathizers, 20%. They made up 20% of the Ukrainian parliamentary, and that is a fact. That's not disinformation. You can easily be looked up by anyone that they were, you know, Azov battalion members, people. In other words, armed 
you know, neo-Nazis, basically, um, that had a significant portion. Um, some well, people would, argue about the percentage, 12 I, to 22. I, I, sorry to interrupt you, but I would mm -hmm. I would argue the fact that they're not neo-Nazis. They're actual Nazis. <laughs> Just know, Nazis, ne yeah. Neo-Nazis yeah. sounds kind of friendly and you, you know, 21st yeah. century. No, these these people, I mean, the, the, the iconography that they use, that's absolutely mm -hmm. direct descendants of Stepan Bandera and the, you know, yeah. Nazis. Yeah. So, sorry. So you, so you have, yeah, no, no, that's okay. That's a, it's a really good point. Um, and, and, you know, you have that aggression that's gone on from NATO where, you know, they made the promise not to go east. They did. They're up against um, Russian borders. Uh, within, you know, a few hours of Moscow, actually, there was talk about biological um, labs, which came to light when Victoria Newland uh, mentioned it at a hearing and, and verified it because then they were calling it Russian misinformation. And then all of a sudden she verified that, yes, there are um, labs made it sound like they were worried about who would get a hold of them. But there are several labs that ended up being owned by the West that could have bioweapons. So you had all of these things playing on the border. And, you know, if that was happening on the Mexican border to the U.S., imagine the response. Imagine the response. Oh, right. We wouldn't. I mean, yeah. we're still, we're still, yeah. we still got to be in our bonnet about Cuba, and that was what seven. Yeah. How many years ago? Sixty. Yeah. Five years. Um, Sixty-three years ago or something. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there's no question that Russia felt that it had to defend its sovereign nation and the people of Donbas, who are ethnically Russian, who speak the language. Many seventy to eighty percent, or even higher, um, are orthodox russian you know christian and needed protection and we're being you know from from 2014 on for eight years fourteen thousand people have been killed by the kiev regime and i call it a regime because it's not a democracy it's it's gotten rid of all its political opposition it's silenced um media in that area that you know, departs from their narrative. Um, it's been very aggressive to its own ethnic residents, um, threatening if they chose to have Russian culture or Russian language, that they would be, um, you know, that there's been dire consequences for that. And people have died. And many people were children that died, unfortunately, those 14,000. So a lot of people in the world that were, you know, observing this, this, um, horrible thing that was going on observed you know wanted russia to come in sooner and 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 help the people of donbass and the people of donbass wanted that help and welcomed the russian soldiers but whenever a journalist reports on that they are threatened and suppressed and like alina lip uh who is a uh investigative journalist on the ground that interviewed people in the donbass who said we are happy the russian soldiers are here they're saving us the German go government responded by threatening her with three years in prison, mm -hmm. um, closing her bank accounts, threatening her parents. She's in her 20s, remember, like close to 30. They threatened her parents and closed down their bank accounts. She had to flee, and she's now safe um, in Crimea with her parents and away from Germany. But, I mean, imagine her whole family had to leave, and her father had to give up his business, I mean, that in Germany, because of her reporting. That's it, her, the truth. And um, I have met people while I'm here in Moscow from different parts of Europe, Ireland, uh, several from the UK and from America who are literally hiding from their own governments because they are against this proxy war that the US and NATO is fighting against Russia via mm -hmm. Ukraine. Yeah, well, as, as my, my old friend Art Neville from the Neville Brothers once wrote in a song that we worked on together, freedom of speech as long as you don't say too much exactly and you know Igor Lopaninik whom I know you know and have had you know him on your show I think if people really want to get educated about Ukraine because it's not that complicated it's really actually very straightforward you can mm -hmm. you can really learn a lot by his documentary Ukraine on fire which is available you know I know they banned it on YouTube but I think it's available on Rumble and other places and that yeah, was a, you can you can find it if you search around hard enough. But <clears throat> yeah. me. it's a great film, actually. It really does explain it, things. Yeah, better than me. <laughs> I think. Well, yeah, and, and you know, Igor is from the former Soviet Union when it was when Ukraine was part of the the, the Soviet Union. So he he really understands it, and it's a very emotional issue for him. This is his 
you know, where he's from. And, and watching this is um, very heartbreaking, I'm sure, for anyone and confusing for, for, for all Slavics involved. Um, you know, and I think that Americans don't really understand it. And uh, definitely we should not be involved in it. And definitely we should not be profiting from it. Well, you just said the magic word. I mean, <clears throat> you know, given that our current administration, well, I'm not going to separate the current administration from pe previous or past possible future administrations, but it seems like it's they're all in bed with, you know, corporate America and <clears throat> not interested in serving their constituents as much as their, you know, their, their corporate sponsors. And, um, you know, war is good for business. I mean, it's a, but it's it's a bonanza for the war industry um you know it's just as medley butler once wrote war is a racket you know so it's um it's just this never ending but it's so it's so heartless and it's so cruel and it's so wrong and it, it, it's just i wish i could i wish we could we collectively people like us could somehow get through to people who say things when you talk about Russia and the current situation. I, you know, I had this conversation with a good friend just the other day, and he asked me straight out, he said, do, well, so do you think it was okay for, was right for Russia to invade Ukraine? And I said, well, right and wrong, that's that's not really the point. It was necessary, is what I said. I, I, I said, I really don't see how how Russia was given many alternatives at this stage in history. So, uh, no. you know. Absolutely. You know, people will argue that is, is because it's very hard to overcome how many decades of anti-Russian propaganda that we've been. And it's also the same with China now. It's looking like we're going to be going up against China militarily in the not too far distant future. So I know that, and that's crazy. I mean, come on. Like, how, how does the U.S. think that it can take on two nuclear powers at once? That's well, insane. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, and think about like the level of error, just the level of errors that could take place in any one of the other. Yeah, it's, it's startling. It's, it's so. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I've been in very close contact with, uh, I don't know if you know him personally, Scott Ritter. But, yeah. uh, you know, he's very adamant about the imminent danger of a nuclear confrontation. Him being a former U.N. weapons inspector, he ought to know, you know, that we're really pushing it, playing with fire here. You know, and it's... We you know, are. You know, I, I think um, our friend Igor described it as not just poking a stick at the bear, meaning Russia, but poking a flaming one. Yes, like how yeah. far, how 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 much are they going to take? Yeah, but there are some red lines, and like, and you know, I've been hearing. In fact, I got into a discussion last night with a friend, a colleague of mine, and we were going back and forth because I'm worried about Crimea, and he was saying, "No, this is a red line. That's not going to happen. It would make an existential threat, and that would mean preemptive nukes were available to you know Russia because it would it would nullify you know the treaty, so it would make it you know." They could do whatever they wanted. They could do full mobilization if you cross that red line. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Like, I, I really, uh, I feel like the West is very desperate for some sort of victory. They're very desperate um, for something. And so I, I'm very concerned uh, for, you know, that it's not going to be NATO necessarily, but America that is going to, you know, kind of push that final uh, boundary if you will. And so my concern is around Crimea and around Poland. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, the hot spots. But I could be wrong. Well, uh, as, as, you know, prophetically, I hope you are, but, you know, the, day, the as you just pointed out, the, the potential, the exponential possibility for a mistake is, 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 is just, you know, I don't know what the calculation would be in mathematical terms, but, but yeah. you know, uh, it's, even during less critical times when the nuclear clock was you know maybe like at you know 11 30 and not 10 minutes to midnight you know back in in the 90s and stuff there were there were a couple of incidents through the 80s and 90s where it was only because of one person i forget there's one specific incident that happened i think in 19 
82 with a Russian military uh, person whose name if I don't recall who who literally was down to him to to make the call you know he'd seen something on the screen that looked like five incoming ballistic missiles he was he had a five minute window to make the call to you know escalate or not and apparently he just sat there and did nothing and to his great relief and to everyone else on the planet's relief although we didn't hear about it it was actually just some reflections of something glinting it wasn't actually missiles so we've come wow. so close to that we've come so close yeah. to this so many times and, and now you know i mean when you hear about you know zaporozhye you know new, the largest nuclear plant in in the entire european continent um being bombed you know being shelled and you're just like yeah what the hell you know and and we not that anyone could win a nuclear conflict but russia has far more greater nuclear capabilities than 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 the united states i mean that's just a fact so you know yeah, they have, and they I, have, and i bet you i bet you scott cuz scott's been to russia and traveled around himself and i'm here and i can tell you without a doubt with no questions asked america does not stand a chance if there is a conflict with russia it will not survive i'm telling you well, not, no, not no, a, the question is, will anyone survive? And right. that's that. That's what. And you know, in his interview with Oliver Stone, uh, President Putin said, you know, no one would win. No one would win. That's his answer to it. But it, it seems like there's nobody in our government. It's it's like they're all a bunch of buffheads. That are, yeah, you know, that's, that's Australian for an idiot who who don't know history. I mean, the one thing that I know yeah. about Russians is they know their history. Yes. You know, and 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 Americans are deprived of that history they have these weird views of the world that don't mm -hmm. correlate with reality and i think a lot of people in our administration like blinken and jake sullivan and all these people like that they don't get it it's like no no i mean that, i mean you've got anthony blinken screaming for russia and jake sullivan screams it for china like if you <laughs> and then and then victoria newland wants both because she's just a full-on neocon She's um so son. yeah and then but then you have people on the other side of the aisle like nikki haley you know same thing and then you have that vivek the, that everyone's talking about one of the republican nominees well he was talking about war with you know he was talking yeah. about punching putin in the nose like stupid things <laughs> like there there's the the bravado the american arrogance the exceptionalism all of it needs to stop it needs to stop from both parties, the uniparty, I call it, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans. And they need to step back and stop trying to impose their culture, their views, their economic and military power on other sovereign nations. The imperialism is what's damaging us. Yeah. And well, it needs to stop. Well, I think one of the, the efforts, certainly on my part and your part, and many of the other people I've spoken to is, you know, we're just trying to get back to some reality that you know R russians are it's a civilized country it's it's a it's not run by thugs and dictators and uh -huh. you know this caricature of the place needs to be you know people need to understand that that is not real <clears throat> you know and oh, that's why i'm so I, I glad am. to have you on the show you know um yeah. I, I would like to ask actually ask you know circle back a little bit to your own life um, you know, surely it must have been really tough. Kind of just, I mean, you have obviously you haven't had a chance to go back and get your stuff. I mean, I did. What about your no. horse? What about your horse and stuff like that? I mean, no. Um, I mean, it's really hard to be away from my family and my pets and my friends and um, my my horse is well taken care of by family members, and I have a trainer. A young woman who is really bonded with him who works with him four times a week so he's in a full care facility and and he, i miss him dearly but he's very well cared for and happy as lark um and he uh he's actually getting really better at riding <laughs> while i've been gone um and he's really learned some new things and so he's doing he's really doing really well um and then my daughter has my cats and i miss them desperately um, and of course that made her cat family quite large. So that's kind of been a running joke for she and her fiance and her fiance has been very patient about all of this. Um, 
but I would just say, yeah, I, of course I miss everything about it. Um, I miss, um, you know, being with family and being with friends and being with my pets, but I don't miss the constant fear and the constant wondering if this is the day that, you know, authorities were going to knock on my door. If this was the day that I was going to be taken in, um, you know, I, I don't miss that. I don't miss the death threats. I don't miss the targeting, you know, and opportunities being pulled out from underneath me, you know, things like that. Um, I feel like I'm rebuilding my life in a positive way and I've made friends here. Um, some are Russian, some are from all over the world, actually from different parts of the world. And haven't run, it's haven't run into my Edward eyes. Snowden, have you? Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, he keeps a pretty low profile. He's a very quiet person and doesn't yeah. want to really be involved with politics. And I don't blame him at this I, point. I, so. I understand. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a, it's a very, you know, um, it's a small community and uh, Moscow, like, it's funny, like I've been out a couple of times and run into people I knew. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And I don't go to the same place every time. So, yeah, you know, it's a big city, but yet small town feel in a sense. Like, I don't know. Um, there's, a, there's a lack of desperation here. And that's one thing I really notice. You know, in, in the United States right now, there's a lot of desperation. And a lot of anger that goes with it. Yeah, because it's economic. It's, you know, people are really struggling financially. And, no, it's um, and that, of I, course... It's palpable. Yeah. I, I see it almost every day. You know, yeah. it's just, you know, it's, it's like a ticking time bomb in a sense. <clears throat> you know, mm -hmm. and, of, and of course, we've got people in our public life that seem to love stoking the flames and well, I just saw this incident that occurred in New York City on Sunday. This there's a guy. It's kind of a well-known New York fisk, fixture named Curtis Sliwa. He started a, he started the organization called the um, um, oh, God, they wear red berets, uh, Guardian Angels, Guardian Angels, mm -hmm. and and he had this rally like this. You know, we need to stop immigration rally up in near Central Park on Sunday, and it turned violent so quickly. I mean, it's just people just punching each other and screaming at each other and burning mm. flags and stomping on each other. You know, and it's just like you could tell that this individual, Curtis Slee, was, was doing this purely for political gain as a kind of a political stunt. You know, because he mm -hmm. apparently he's running, wants to run for mayor of New York City, and you've got these. I call them, you know, these kind of carnival barkers, you know, Donald Trump's another one. These people that just go around stoking the flames of hatred and it, and it's so easily done. So, you know, it's, it's, it feels dangerous here to me. That's, that's all I can say. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I frankly agree that there's danger from that, but there's also, just danger in general. I mean, you know, Donald Trump is is not someone I voted for, not someone I supported, but yet um, him being indicted and booked into jail with 19 other people and most of them his attorneys. Oh, that's like, such nonsense. Yeah, I mean, that what that's going to do is put a chilling effect on anyone being able to get legal counsel. You know, I mean, how, how can you... Um, get legal how you know why would anyone in their right mind want to represent like because i have a law degree and if i were back in the states and some politician came to me for representation i'd be like no not, i don't think so mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry go somewhere else i'm not gonna you know be subject to being put in jail right that's a good so it's point pretty, it's, yeah. it, i mean it's putting a, a long-term chilling effect on politics on people who you would even want to run. If you have the chance of going to jail just because your political opponent thinks you're going to win, um, and so it's trying to take you out, you know what? That's that's not good. And that's not a democracy, is it? No, but it does seem, you know, because there are so many people that, are, <clears throat> that um, don't want to hear that aspect of things because they just, they perceive, and I don't want to make this all about Donald Trump all of a sudden, but... Right. You know, there, there's so many people that view him as, a, as as an existential threat to our, quote, so-called democracy, that it doesn't matter how we get rid Like, I have a 
very good friend. And he said, when it comes to this guy, I don't care. Like, forget about the rules. Just get rid of him because it's oh, too and easy. and how and then ask that friend how those rules are going to apply when his candidate. I is know, up. but it, but it's it's kind of like they don't. It, they, it's like a sinking ship mentality. It's like, well, if we don't do this, we're all going to drown. Then there will be. Well, I think I think we're all drowning. It's done. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but America has lost free speech. But when you start becoming lawless and start attacking your political opponents. I mean, you know, the words that Europeans are using for right now for U.S., banana republic. That's what it's being I've, called. I've, I've heard that so many times. You know, I've heard yeah. that. You know, and, and um, it's, yeah. it's not a bad, it's, again, and I'm glad you said that. It's This isn't an indictment of the American people, of which I am now mm -hmm. a sub, uh, one myself. It's, it's the system, and it's this yeah. just never-ending political theater that's just distorted our minds you know so so you don't see well, any of that and you, and you, yeah <laughs> and you know it's funny you said that because one of the interesting things that happened to me was um reading some of the the responses to my press conference when i said i was here in russia and i talked about what because they don't even know what america is really like they still there are people here that still think it's the land of promise oh i meet people um, like that i have a friend from ukraine came here yeah he was like, oh, so, you know, I, and it's eight months later, I said, how's it going, Alexei? Well, you know, yeah. it's not so good here. Things are very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I just found it um, interesting, right, um, that, you know, people have here have this view of America like it's really, really great. No, it's not. And and things are really falling apart and they're hiding it. You know, there a lot a lot of it's being hidden. But to go back to what I was going to say is about the media. <clears throat> One a USA Today article, a, a former CIA agent said he was viscerally angry um, with <laughs> he was viscerally angry about the way I talked about inflation. And I thought, well, I don't know if he threw in the, the word viscer viscerally, but that, that kind of was amusing, right? But the point right. is, is that, you know, I'm talking about inflation that's being caused artificially and the, the basically the working class losing, you know, their footing because of the elites. I wasn't mm -hmm. talking about the American citizen. I'm talking about the people running the country, in particular, the Biden administration, which is very corrupt. And there's no question. You have 22 shell companies that Joe Biden had um, hidden to move money around. You had at least $50 billion that came into his family's pockets. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. When he was vice president, we don't even know what's been going on now. Like this was when he was vice president. You know, and, and um, they're doing all this. They have all this proof. They have bank receipts. They have wire transfer receipts. They have proof of the shell companies. They have witnesses. And still, the Democrats are saying, oh, this is Russian disinformation. It's like, no, you know, banks don't make up their wire transfers. And shell companies don't pop up out of, you know, nowhere that are attached to Joe Biden. They found him with like 53 aliases for his emails or something like that. I mean, come on. Like yeah, this John, guy is it, John Peters, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Bob. Yeah. I mean, there is no question how corrupt this dude is. And but but again, you know, you know to push yeah. back a little bit, because I, I like I keep saying, I, I've had these conversations and most of my friends are left leaning, i.e. Democrats and so forth <clears throat> and green people. So but mm -hmm. somebody the other day when I brought you know, they were talking about Trump and the, the indictments and the corruption. And I said, well, yeah, but let's talk about the same thing with the current president. And they said, oh, it doesn't, there's no comparison. You know, it's just like apples and oranges. It's not, it's no comparison. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't believe that. I don't agree with that. I, mm -hmm. I think that, I think that some of the, like you just said, I mean, not to mention the financial corruption, but, you know, being putting us into this precarious position with yeah. Russia, which is only exact, you know, not that Trump was great on it, but he even didn't get us quite this close to World War III. So, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. I mean, he didn't. And that's the case. I mean, you can say whatever you want to about Trump or, or that he didn't bring us to the brink of nuclear war, which we are now. And but, you know, however, who's to say what he would do with China? Right. Because he's pretty aggressive about China. Yes, so I don't yes. know. Well, like, I, and I, you have Mitch, you know, yeah, you, have, all... you have Republicans like Mitch McConnell, who are obviously, you know, making money from the Ukraine thing and who are all for it. You have Republicans that are supporting it. Um, you have Pence who's out there. He might as well. People have been setting up memes that say it's the United States of, of Ukrainian. That's where Pence thinks he is. You know, like so they're making fun of him. Um, so yeah, so you have both parties just part of the neocon effort to to enrich the weapons manufacturers. And you know, and I think last time we talked, I talked about Leon Panetta. Yes. you know, trotting around MSNBC. And uh, just a reminder, he's on the board of Raytheon, which is one of the missile makers. And he and remember that Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and those major companies made not billions, trillions of dollars since this conflict has begun. So that's who's getting rich. And it's not the working class in Russia, Ukraine, or America, or Europe, for that matter. And meanwhile, you know, any any candidate that's um, outspoken uh, regarding this this conflict um, gets uh, shut down, like Cornell West or RFK Jr. or anybody like that, Marion Williamson. Not that I, I I'm very supportive of Cornell West, but not so much the other two people. But but still, you know, it's it's a shame. Marianne, Marianne Williamson is a joke. She's basically, her foreign policy is nil. She has no sense of history, no education or background to really um, have articulate a formulated foreign policy. Her position about Ukraine, and she talked about the Department of Peace, and then she talked about wanting weapons to go to Ukraine as part of peace. She's a hypocrite. She's really just one of those sheep herders trying to get people back in the Democratic Party. I don't trust her. I don't like her. I don't respect her. And she's on a book tour, basically. She's on I, a self-funded book yeah, tour. I, I kind of look and, her. She's kind of yeah. a snake oil sales, saleswoman. Anybody yeah. who's been on Oprah Winfrey and sells <laughs> imaginary products to a to unwitting people with too much money and not enough common sense. And then RFK Jr., I mean, he says a lot of great stuff, but I can't get past his policy regarding, you know, Israel and the Palestinians because that's just exactly. so yeah. bizarre. But look, T Tara, um, I'm going to let you go in a second because, um, well, okay, I've kept you on here quite a while. Um, are there any last impressions and, and thoughts that you'd like to, to leave leave us with? Um positive or, just, ne or negative <laughs> well I, I mean i'm waiting to get my asylum my official asylum um from russia and, and hopefully i do i'm doing fine for those people that have inquired um like how are they treating me? and i'm doing great i'm more worried about americans and europeans frankly <laughs> I, I feel like i'm on on the right side of history and i'm doing okay um what i would say is you know choose your news carefully go to independent you know, shows like yours. I have a podcast called The Politics of Survival. It's independence it's on Friday it's nights. It's a great show. I, I yeah, thank urge you. everybody and then, to listen to that. <laughs> and I have a book, um, uh, you know, that left out when the truth doesn't come in, come, left out when the truth doesn't fit in. And I am doing the audio version of that, uh, oh, which will great. be coming out. And the paper book is out now. So, yeah, and I'm adding to it. I'm adding, um, of course, the Russia chapter. So mm -hmm. that's coming. And, uh, you know, and I've got the TNT radio. I'm on Monday through Friday from 4 to 5 with Sasha Karnikokova. She and I um, uh, are broadcast live from Moscow, and we, we interview a lot of different people about different things. Uh, so you can find me, just tarreadpodcast.com is the easiest way, R-E-A-D-E. -E. And you can find my Twitter and all that. And uh, I appreciate you having me on. I really do. Well, that was Hanoi Jane talking to us from North Vietnam. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> do you ever get those kind of accusations? Oh, of course, of course. But you know what? Um, I, you know, I have to say, I'm really uh, hopeful that people are starting to wake up because I noticed that people are starting to turn more to independent news sources, and that's that's really so. Go out there and, and travel and explore and find out for yourselves and get your own views, like. You don't have to listen to me. 
um, come here, come to Moscow, come to different places. Well, there's plans and there's yeah. between you and I and whoever happens to be listening to the show right now, there, there are plans, undisclosed plans in the works for such an opportunity to occur in the relatively near future for myself and a few other good hearted souls. So we may be seeing you. Good. Inshallah, as they, as they say. Inshallah. <laughs> yes, I am here. I am here and I and uh I would love to show you around. So it's it's a beautiful place. I'll take you to the farmers market. It's really great. Oh, sounds wonderful. So. All right. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, thank Tara. You. Be well and we'll talk to you Take again care. real soon. Thank you so much. week's secret track and if you can guess what that was or who did it you'll win a valuable prize i don't know what the prize would be but um <laughs> i'm sure i can find one somewhere in the cupboards around here at the radio station 
With Elle, that was a nice interview with Tara Reid. She's such a lovely person, and she's been through an awful lot, and uh, she deserves a break. So I'm just so happy to hear that she's doing well. So Tara, we all love you very much and are thinking of you, and hopefully we'll uh, get to meet at some point in the not-too-distant future. Well, in honor of Tara, I've put together a song list. Oh, and I just wanted to make sure that I don't forget to send a shout-out to the show's producer, the fearless, intrepid, and ever-hardworking Liz Hill. Thank you so much for always, as always, organizing things and making it all come together. Do appreciate it. Teamwork's the thing. Well, here's a song. Uh, <laughs> I, it's it's from the male perspective, but Tara, this is for you. It's a track by... Um, Loudon Wainwright III, uh, it's, he's the guy who wrote a couple of hit songs in the 60s. Anyway, this is a song called The Expatriate. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. You can keep my bicycle, all of my records and tapes. Might seem sentimental. Or sound like sour grapes Sell my clothes and furniture Or give them to the Goodwill store I'm going overseas I'm not coming back anymore Maybe it's a little romantic For a middle-aged man like me I'm gonna be an expatriate Just you wait and see Living in a garret in Paris A house bold in Amsterdam Smoking a beard Growing a pipe Doing the best I can Like Again, I'm gonna go to T.T. Wait and see Fine little brown-skinned girl To fall in love with me You'll get For years and years You're gonna wonder just where I've gone Maybe when I'm 80 years old, I'll come back home. There'll be parades and ceremonies. Retrospectives, too. And that brown-skinned girl will be so sad. I came back to you. You can keep my bicycle. All of my records and tapes We start with a country, a country, a country But lithium, bananas, oil or gold Then send in the army, marines, mercenaries The navy and air force till we overthrow and who does the killing, the killing, the killing? A soldier, a sailor with gun in their hand. They follow orders and say they are willing to destroy a place that they don't understand. They come from the farms and the factories, offices, classrooms and trades to fill in the ranks. They come back broken in mind and their bodies used up by the weapons, dealers and banks. And who gets the profits, the profits, the profits of 100, 1000, 2000 percent? It comes from the pockets, the pockets, the pockets of people you think would be recalcitrant. It goes to the makers of abominations, mathematical manipulation. 
A simple corporate war calculation Out of your paycheck they call it taxation You pay for the wheeling and dealing and stealing You pay for the bullets and bombs and the tanks Napalm and nukes and lobbyists sell it Did GE and Westinghouse ever say thanks? War is a racket and who does the killing With missiles and mortars, grenades and guns They come back broken in mind and their bodies Used up by the Raytheon politicians Um, Gordon Bach, uh, before that we heard War is a Racket by Tom Nielsen from his album Give Trees a Chance. And we started off with uh, Loudon Wainwright III with Expatriate from More Love Songs. Just a quick word about Gordon Bach. Uh, when I was making a record back in whatever year it was, uh, helping make a record, I should say, really, with Bob Dylan, uh, the album's called Oh Mercy, and at one point I asked Mr. Dillon who his favorite songwriters were. And the first two I, I heard of, Gordon Lightfoot, of course, and Chris, Chris Christopherson. But he, um, he also revealed his deep, uh, Bob's deep folk roots by saying his other favorite singer-songwriter was Gordon Bach. And I said, oh, I've, gosh, I've never even heard of this guy. And Anyway, I've since become a huge fan of his. He's still around, actually. He, performs pretty regularly, lives up in Maine, and he's got a beautiful, I, love, I just love the sound of his voice and the, that 12-string guitar, and he just brings brings a kind of a, you know, there's so many great things about this country, it's, it's just so sad to see it being squandered by our greedy corporate masters and politicians, their greedy lapdog politicians, because America, the spirit of America is great, it's just a uh, I think we've lost our, our way a little bit. The next track I'm going to play is a track by Yusuf Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam, otherwise known as Cat Stevens. It's from his new record called King of a Land. And the other day I watched a really beautiful interview with, with Yusuf Islam, Cat Stevens. And he was talking about one of the reasons that he sort of kind of transitioned back into doing his older music is that he realized that... Um, you know, there's so many misconceptions about Islam, and uh, and Islam is really a religion of peace. I mean, a lot of people don't even understand that 
in the Quran, they talk about Jesus. And uh, there's, but it's been like everything else that's been made into the enemy. It's been so vilified and we've become so afraid. So, you know, in, in the spirit of this program, trying to break down the barriers and use music to help do that. This is a, the, one of the, one of my favorite songs from the new album by Yusuf Islam, otherwise known as Cat Stevens. It's a title track called King of a Land. If I was a king of a land I'd free every woman and man I'd let them go oh, 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 oh. I'd set them free To serve If I knew every fish in the sea And every bird in the tree I'd hear their call oh, mm -hmm. I'd hear them speak Your name Of this world, I teach every boy and girl. I let them learn the truth. Ooh. I'd let them know your glory. If I had the stairs to the sky. I'd raise my voice up there high I'd want the world to hear, hear, hear Your perfect words And thank you If I had a mountain of gold I tried to feed every poor soul And give them hope again And let them taste Your bounty If I could reach every dream I still would search the unseen To find a way That leads us to Your mercy If I was a king of a land I'd free every woman a man I'd let them go Broadcasting for 1970. Decreasing six in Humber later. 
rain then showers, moderate or poor becoming good. Southwesterly, 6 to gale 8, occasionally severe gale 9. At the third stroke, it will be 11, 24 and 50 seconds. the music on with the show here's uh, one of the most outspoken rap artists singer whatever you want to call him people out there who is always willing to put his his politics into his lyrics without fear low key in collaboration with immortal technique this is a track called voices voices of the voiceless from the album soundtrack to the struggle These times are coming. We told you about them, but you motherfuckers were sleeping. Now you gotta wake up. The time has come. Low key. Yeah. Immortal technique. Harlem motherfucker. <laughs> we yeah. Let's make history. Uh. we 
West 10 to the West Bank I write righteous rhymes with my right and wrestle the devil with my left hand Never work for a Zion, it's never been a yes man My art is like Rembrandt painting pictures of death camps The average person is allergic to the words of wisdom This is for everyone and Saddam's Kurdish murder victims And all the pure souls that never had the chance to speak Truth pumps in my heart a reason causes my heart to beat The soldiers haunted and tortured by guilty memories Who realise too late to reveal their real enemy It's all dead wrong for every victim of Racist persecution from Auschwitz to Hebron My words may sting cowards For people that were atomized by the third mate In the Twin Towers Those living through the wars Ask me what I do this for Put the world in its place Before it puts you in yours You can try to avoid us but it's pointless You can never avoid the voices of the voiceless Try to avoid us, but it's pointless. You can never avoid the voices of the voices. Keep my third eye hidden under my New York fitted. A crazy unmarried man that deserves to be committed. The future is encrypted in my troubled lyrics. Dream that I've been somewhere for weeks and wake up in a couple minutes. Sweat dripping with visions of population control. Thoughts overflowing my world like the melting of the North Pole. My people are targeted by military crack committees. So I'm bucking at the feds like natives in Rapid City. Reality savage. My words are like a riot in Paris, the voice of the voiceless, that voice is social and balance, so stand stronger, sit harder in your mental palace, blinded inside the kingdom, united to its old habits, middle passage coming, war chant, African drumming, Gatlin gun humming, rapid fire mechanism, reckless living, that checks the rhythm of perfectionism, slave condition, why you singing, God save the system. Try to avoid us, but it's pointless. You can never avoid the voices of the voiceless. You can try to avoid us, but it's pointless. You can never avoid the voices of the voiceless. Detain my body, but you can't imprison my mind. If it's my time, I'll probably die with my fist in the sky. These are the thoughts of a man who can't escape from his coma. Cries of a young virgin girl who got raped by them soldiers. Hurting a screaming bastard, post colonial nation. Subject to childhood diseases, famine, war, and inflation. Education molded you into your master's image. And you forgot who the fuck you were before the war was finished. You're hearing the ghosts of Nagasaki, you're hearing Hiroshima. Beautiful babies. Being born with the weirdest features You might never see me in the chart But inshallah my seed can see peace in Iraq But peace and freedom can never be given That's historically forbidden Cause only collision is the recipe Changing the course of destiny So I'm strapped with weaponry Cause the government don't give a fuck about protecting me Try to avoid us, but it's pointless. You can never avoid the voices of the voiceless. You can try to avoid us, but it's pointless. You can never avoid the voices of the voiceless. Oh, 
والصبر أخدته معي خبيته بعيوني عفراك أهلي يا يما بالله لا تلموني والصبر أخدته معي خبيته بعيوني عفراك Как-то, ребята, не может быть Ребята, ну может быть Да, простите, не собрались Разбежались, но без пыли Просто забыли И ты идешь по тем же тротуарам Но сама уже Мигает тот же свет Важно же 
Где же мой моя, хоть ты не моя, меланхолия? Когда сожмет грусть, когда будет грусть, когда не будет, может и бред. Но я приду на свет. Вот мы моя. that break we heard um, the last track was uh, called Mark by the um, Belarusian group Nemiga which I featured quite often on this program for that a Palestinian a beautiful Palestinian singer by the name of Rim Bana the track is called The Night Has Fallen Down from the album Seasons of Violet and to start off we heard Low Key with Im- and uh, Immortal Technique a track called Voice Voices of the Voiceless. I'm um, going to go out for the last little bit of the show with some um, some more of that famous ketamine tripping music that I like to play sometimes. Here's a track by a Russian group. Don't ask me the name of them. I'll look it up while it's playing.
track by uh, probably my favorite electronic artist, John Hopkins. The track is called Open Eye Signal. Before that, we heard Repose 2 by uh, ambient group Hilliard. Anyway, it's coming to the end of the show. It's been uh, good bringing this music and conversation to you, as always. Stay tuned for uh, Freedom Highway with your host, Nick Pankins, coming up right after this. If the good Lord's willing and the creek don't rise, we'll see you next week.